I think this is the most memorable, famous tagline of film history. It could be. In space, no one can hear you scream. Brilliant. I have a hard time thinking. I, if someone asked me a tagline for this movie, even before I had seen it, I would have been able to tell it to you. Yeah. But I don't think I could tell you any other tagline for any movie <laughs> off the top of my off head. Off the top of my head? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and what a fucking tagline that is. Mm-hmm. My God, that chilling. You hear it now. Um, and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like the first time that that concept came across your bow, oh, mm-hmm. oh, ice cold, man. I don't know. You're on Midnight Local, the podcast from How to Drink, where we just talk about things. Movies. Uh, pop culture. Maybe some video games. That too. All the things. The things, the stuff and things. All of the stuff and the things on Midnight Local. Let's get to it. This is Alien. Alien. Which is funny because I could have said, this is Alien. You are on the Nostromo with Sigourney Weaver uh, from the uh, Great Movie Ride. I don't know if you recall that. Okay. Oh, it's, it's in my notes. We can we can start there. but That's where the, the part when you don't have the tour guide and yeah. it, like the voiceover takes over. She's gone. Or he. Um, they. Oh, it's still true. <laughs> true um i didn't grow up with this movie but i did because of the great movie ride yeah that's funny so we're talking about alien today on midnight local a movie i love because we're back to my favorite titties love hippies hippie dan o'bannon yeah <laughs> yeah oh, wait, hippies love titties that was what we said hippies love about. titties dan o'bannon is back this is our third time we've come across him what was uh, the second <sighs> i know the first was return of the living dead yeah, but we we said maybe we just mentioned him in another episode because we've come back to hippies love titties a couple of times. It's fact, baby. <laughs> uh, are you? What are you? Are you drinking from a giant? It's rain, a uni- unicorn. Okay, so my picture is very degraded for, as I'm seeing it right now. So for a little while we were collecting unicorn mugs, but we've stopped because all of their horns have broken off. Yeah, well that'll happen. Makes sense. But, yeah, this was. It says, don't let anyone ever dull your sparkle. Ooh, how lovely. Don't let them do it either. Yeah, I've had a little cold, so I'm trying to mitigate with something hot to drink while we talk. Good idea. Sorry about your cold. Doing my best. Thank you. All right, let's get into it. Alien 1979 rated R. Apparently it's an hour and 57 minutes long with an $11 million budget grossing $106 million worldwide. We can call that a hit. Writers Dan O'Bannon, which you just mentioned, he also wrote Return of the Living Dead. There's a really key point to this film that compares for me to the Return of the Living Dead that I want to talk about later. There's yeah. a really important story point that I feel like it has to come from Dan O'Bannon. It does, I'm sure. Ronald Shushit from this first story credit. I don't know what that means. Uh, I think he just probably outlined a story that someone turned into a screenplay. Well, story credit is like the credit they both have. I was just making sure that he wasn't just like, he wrote a book or a Mm -hmm. thing that it was based off of because we've run into that a couple of times. So just verifying that he is actually a writer of the screenplay. Got it. So Sigourney Weaver, Ripley. It's amazing. She got the part you noted. Yeah. I mean, Meryl was being considered Helen Mirren, Catherine Ross, who had done The Graduate. Oh, wow. Uh, but I guess someone saw Sigourney Weaver on Broadway and kept just like bringing her up. She asked to audition. She asked to audition. Wow. And I guess like her agent or someone sent her to the wrong place or she was like a block away. So she was half hour late, but they stuck around and saw her. So it was just one of those like maybe wouldn't have happened sort of stories. So th- I think this is like her first movie too, right? She had done like little th- little shorts and sure. things. So like, yeah, this is definitely her breakout role. Yeah, this movie would have sucked without her. And just like her look, everything. And I, I think- Meryl Streep in this role would have been a disaster. Wrong, just wrong. Yeah, there are people who are too big for these roles sometimes, you know? And like- I'm Just imagining Alien as Kramer versus Kramer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and- Meryl hadn't really done anything. Um, Sophie's action Choice. Action adventure. No, I don't even think she has yet, really. No, I think, I mean, when we were cu- doing Death Becomes Her, we noted that that was like one of her first really special effects heavy movies. And yeah, she didn't really so. love doing it. Apparently, someone in her life had passed away and she was still mourning their loss. And so she just was like, not going to audition. Okay. 
Well, I don't know how seriously she was pursued. For Alien. Got it. Mm-hmm. Okay. For Alien. Um, and then I guess they kept showing Sigourney's screen test to like secretaries at Fox and other women to see how they responded to her. And she was super relatable for them. That's actually funny. Um, similarly, rid- uh, so we're going to talk about Aliens in another episode. But briefly, I want to mention James Cameron when he was casting um, for Titanic. Everybody kept telling him, you got to have uh, 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 Kate Winslet. No, nah, the other one, the guy, the Caprio for this part. Oh. They were pushing at him. And he was like, all right, well, we'll have him come in to read. Um, and they were like, no, no. Like, basically, people were saying that this guy doesn't have to read. And he was like, no, everybody mm. reads for me. Like, that's, I cast my movies. We don't just like book superstars Alan. to be in. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And he said he came in to read and he's like, I wasn't really impressed with his audition, but I did notice the way all the women in the office looked at him. So I figured he was the guy for the job. <laughs> uh, worked. I mean, seventh grade me. It worked for me. He also, interesting. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Loved Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, okay. Neat. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that says about old Leo. Um, all right. Sorry. Serious, immediate derailing there. Yeah, I mean, then she's obviously gone on that this is an iconic role, but she was not stuck in it by any means. She's been in tons of stuff. You said iconic role, and my immediate thought was an iconic cast. I mean, Sigourney Weaver, of course, is the heart and soul of this movie and is the breakout. Yeah. You know, like uh, this is Sigourney's movie, but Tom Skerritt, John Hurt, uh, Harry Dean Stanton, Ian Holm, Yafit Kodo, uh, and I, Veronica Cartwright, who. I, I mentioned, but she doesn't really come up much elsewhere. But like the birds, <laughs> she she's, was in the birds. Yeah, she is the birds. I oh, think that was she's, her movie. Oh, she. I think she's the lead character in that movie. Wow, she those was, are the pictures of her anyway. So, okay. well, less known to me, but like the rest of those names are huge. Really, maybe Yaffa yeah. Kodo is the the least well known. It's funny. She's the most. If she is that character, she's the most recognizable to me. Oh yeah, I've seen the birds. I was well, very young. Ian Holm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, come on, Ian Holm. John Hurt? No, John Hurt? Like, recognizable, sure, but not movies that I've watched over and over. Harry Potter. Who's he in Harry Potter? Ollivander. Oh, he passed away recently. Yeah, okay, then yes. And a billion other things. He's in the nineteen eighty. He's in 1984. I mean, I can't, on and on and on, I can't even. Yeah. He's one of those people that's just like in everything. Yeah. Um, a British institution unto one. <laughs> yeah. We have very different media upbringings. Like for it's, it's like Tom Skerritt, most recognizable to me from Steel Magnolias. Okay. I never saw that. I don't know what else I would know him from, to be honest, yeah. but I know maybe it's just alien, but I think, I don't know. I know that guy from something. Yeah. He's got one of those faces. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Steel Magnolias, he's barely in too, because the play is an all female cast and they bring in some of the guys for the movie, but they're not really huge roles. Gotcha. Cause they're written in. Yeah. Tom Skerritt. I mean, I don't know. He seems so familiar to me, maybe I'm thinking of something else. I don't know. Maybe I'm just thinking of this. I mean, it's every person in this cast is so important to the movie because right. you are in a closed system besides the mo the planet, the scene on planet. Uh, but you're not meeting any other humans on planet that are going to join your cast. So this is it. Oh, well, he's in Top Gun. He's yeah, in Top Contact. Gun. Mm-hmm. River runs through it. He's in big stuff. Yeah. He's in tons of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, that's an interesting point, too. I didn't ever think about it. That I mean, I guess in a lot of horror movies, that would be the case. But, like, everybody gets their moment here. Mm-hmm. You know, like, we did just talk about The Matrix. You know, this is true facts. And I think one of the things that I was thinking is missing for me, and I always said that, like, and then they just kill off all of that cast. Mm-hmm. But, like, you don't really... I don't know. You don't really get much connection to those other characters. It's true. They're just kind of there, their you background, get and then they get obliterated. Yeah, because he's got the chicken scene. But like yeah. in this, I don't know. Everybody feels very in the movie, very yeah. present in this movie. They all mm-hmm. really like. Um, they're you know they exist. They yeah. lived. They lived. I, damn it. I'm with you. I would argue that like Switch has a couple of moments and then APOC is just sort of like, why, why are you there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but everyone's got their, their moments in this, this movie for sure. Yep. So, and then this is Ridley's second feature film. 
Yes. Uh, his first feature film was a movie called The Duelists, which is an interesting movie. I haven't seen it since film school. We had a teacher who made us watch it. Um, maybe we should revisit it if we're going to do so much Ridley. Uh, you know, there's like uh, something happens to a director who's very good at their job. Uh. They become unremarkable. Like, and and it's a generational thing. Like John Ford, very good at his job. You never like say, oh God, a John Ford movie anymore. You think, oh, okay, John Ford did this. It'll be, I know what I'm in for. It'll be a, a well-made film, uh, you know, or William Wyler. I mean, I do because I'm like a film historian like guy, but uh-huh. like, I feel like uh, Ridley Scott is that like it, it, to some extent, like people don't think of it as a Ridley Scott movie, but like, Oh, these are movies that were directed by Ridley Scott anymore. Like he is yeah. becoming invisible in some ways. Am I wrong on that? I don't know. I think that's partially true. I also think he has had some misses. He probably, ha- I mean, I'm sure he has. Yeah. I think that his more recent work, people are not as excited by. So, He's so old. He's so <laughs> old. Is uh, he that old? Yeah. I mean, he certainly seems it when you hear him talk. I mean, yeah. He's so uh, his his director's commentaries. He must have hated doing director's commentaries, which mm-hmm. I always made me adore them because they were just so cantankerous and just like vicious. And he'd be like, oh, this scene right here. So I was making this. I'm doing like the worst. This is not at all how he sounds at all. That's actually much more John Hurt. But <laughs> He's like, so when we did this scene, uh, we we shot with the spaceship looking down at the cameras. We're looking up at the back of it, and you see there's water dripping off of the engines as they fire up. This is actually straight out of Alien. And, mm-hmm. I, um, and you see this water dripping, and I thought, well, it's plasma, it's liquid, and stuff like that. And somebody asked me, why would that be there? And I said, why are you asking me that? It's my fucking movie. Mm-hmm. I know what I'm doing. You know, and he's just like, every time anybody like presumed to ask him a question, his response apparently by his own volition was, fuck you. <laughs> you deign to ask me a question. You know how long I've been making movies for? <laughs> like, but which would be funny for Alien because he hadn't been making movies. As yes, the studio was re- who really pushed back on the water thing, the dripping water. So, yes. And actually, I'm misrepresenting that because I was speaking of his director's commentary on Prometheus, which I watched. Because mm-hmm. I was like, okay. I watched that movie and I was like, what in the fuck was this? God, I got to hear what he thought about it. And yeah. He was angry. He, uh, okay. I just like fast forward through it a couple of times. And every time I felt like I was zapping into like angry grandpa screaming at clouds, just like pissed off. And like <laughs> you could pick any part in the movie. And he was relating some story about like, and then they said this to me, the audacity of that yeah. person at that moment to say that. And I know how to make a movie. God damn it. I've been making them for a while. And it was just like, wow, dude, like you, you got some bitterness for a dude who's as rich as you. He does, but also just believes like that he is proven himself. So yeah. the studios coming in and doing their money making thing where yeah. they're like, do this, not this. Like, yeah, that would frustrate the hell out of me too. I think that they were cast the crew people in this case, just asking him, Oh, oh. sure boss. Why do you want it like that? None of your business. <laughs> but like we talked about on blade runner, he seems like a real asshole. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I don't, I don't know. I do not read him needing to see every mug for that scene as good directing only he can make it a, a make a choice i see it as indecisive i see it as someone who's terrified to make a decision i think it comes from fear absolutely i yeah. think it comes from fear but i think that to that end a record like n- knowing that <laughs> him knowing that i need to see every mug because i don't have you know what i mean like I don't know. That's like how he directs through his fear. You know what I'm saying? Like he is got that fear. He has that indecision. And so he would be actually paralyzed and lose control, control of his filmmaking. If he didn't have that white knuckle grip on everything, it'd be better if he didn't need the white knuckle grip. Yeah. (laughs) But if you need it to make the movie work, you better get it. I guess. I think that's something that only white men can get away with. Uh, Sure that level of money wasting indecisiveness. I, you know, you hear the same shit about, um, uh, uh, I've definitely heard similar comment now. Oh, well, money wasting indecisiveness. I don't know. I I've heard similar comments about like real, uh, task mastering. Like I've heard that, um, Oh, what's her name? The director who did the hurt locker. Is that heard? Is that Gail Ann Hurt? Uh, no, no, she's a producer. You're talking about Kate, uh, 
Catherine. Catherine. Catherine Bigelow. I've heard she Bigelow. can be Bigelow. tough to work with as well. Although she kind of went to the James Cameron School of Directing. <laughs> I think, yeah, look, a lot of these directors are real assholes, which I, is why the industry is, keeps having these come to Jesus I, moments. Well, I, I think to some extent, right? Like the idea of a director, at least in its modern conception, which maybe we're getting away from now, like, hey, this movie is my vision. This, is the, this represents right. my singular vision. That's an asshole. That's a job for an asshole. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, like rock star yeah. is an asshole's job. You know, all of these people need to have their eyes on me. You know, like only an asshole. Only. Normal I think it's one of the most <laughs> challenging things about filmmaking is like you can't make a movie on your own. You can't. You That's can right. paint a painting on your own. You can write a book mostly on your own. You have editors, but like more or less you can sit down and write a book. Um, you can't make a movie that way. So the role of a director is not just singularly I uh, like the singular person with the vision. You have to collaborate. You have to. You cannot be a good director if you can't collaborate. That is my, I'll put that out there is my opinion. I agree. Go, go I, paint a picture. Yeah. No, no. Write I, a comic book. I agree. I like that take. However, I'm trying to think of successful directors whom – uh, certainly not at this budget, um, whose attitude about like onsets happenings is frequently like, and that's what they did. And so they brought that to set and I said, yeah, okay, whatever you got, let's go with that. Like maybe, um, oh God, people who trust their crew. I think there's directors who trust their crew. What's his name with the hair? I don't know. I don't hear that in interviews and stuff like that. I, you hear like, uh, you know, that didn't serve my vision. We needed to fix this. That wasn't working for us. Uh, no, not like so much. Like I asked so-and-so to design a car for me. This is the car he showed up with. And I had no notes. Uh, I just said like, that's fine. Thanks for the car. I don't know. I think you find, yeah, I get, I think you find that with special effects studios, certainly like the people who were figuring out, I don't know. I, I feel like with Blade Runner, the guy who did do design his cars, he trusted Sid Mead. Mm-hmm. And did the storyboards. I think that's actually a specific case where uh, if I recall, he was like, uh, I don't want to speak out of turn. I yeah, thought maybe that he I'm had wrong about real that, problems but... with Sid's designs, <laughs> but it yeah. would take me a minute to look that up. And the matrix, certainly when Jeff Darrow, that's, I meant to mention that in the matrix, ep- matrix episode, but he was their storyboard artist, and he mm. came in and brought the movie to life in a way that they weren't being able to sell to the studios. Okay. Got it. Um, they trusted whatever wizard figured out bullet time to figure out bullet time. Like, I don't know. Well, but they also, you we're going backwards in time, but they, you also said that they were told five times that it couldn't be done or something like that. So when yep. someone mm-hmm. came to them and said it couldn't be done, they said, fuck you. It can be, you know, true. But that's to me, they're finding the right collaborator. That's they're not figuring it out on the, Oh, we can do it. We figured it out on our own. If I fire 10 art directors in a row to find the right one. Am I being an asshole or am I being a good collaborator? What's where's the line there? (laughs) If you are able to work with the 10th, then you just need to find the right person for the job. What if I kept the wrong person for the job and we had a rough relationship and everybody's going to say I'm a giant asshole for all time, a rough relationship or it made the movie worse. The movie's the movie, you know, we're talking about the movie. It came out. Obviously people make movies under duress and with, with lots of Durham and strong on set. I don't know. I mean, I'm not defending the idea that directors are assholes. Actually, I think that like I'm, I'm saying that they are assholes, and I wish they weren't. But yeah, it does seem like a job for an asshole. <laughs> I do think more and more, unfortunately, and I'm, I can't speak. I'm not going to go too deep into this. Not get myself in trouble. Sure. But directors are people who have worked the system the best. Oh yeah to be able to call themselves directors and don't do shit anymore. Fair enough. <laughs> well, and, I mean, especially with like studio budgets, right? Like yeah. wh- how many points of input does somebody have really on, you know, something that there's merchandising being built yeah. off the back of, you know, mm-hmm. Hey, I don't think that that dinosaur serves my vision. That's too bad. We've already made the fucking toys. It needs right. a minute and a half of screen time or else you're fired. Like, <laughs> I think a lot of times they are attached to, to a movie based on the success of another movie to help market the movie. 
I remember, I remember, um, man, we went right off the rails on this one, unfortunately, but I do, sort of. but we, we didn't do our little chat at the beginning. So we'll, we'll come back to it. I remember when they were doing the star Wars sequels when they were coming out and there was all this talk about, you know, who they're going to get to direct, um, the first one, whatever this, what was that? The rise of the force, right? Rise of the force, whatever the force awakens. Okay, whatever. Rise of Force, Force Awakens. The, the Force got the fuck up. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> Hello, Force. Get up. <laughs> you got places to be. Um, I just remember thinking, like, but who would want the job? Yeah. Like, realistically, like, who would want the job? Somebody who's never directed and, like, just loves Star Wars would want the job. They're not going to get it. They don't have the capabilities. Who's got the capabilities that wants the job? Because, like, you're not going to get a really well-established director who's going to want to come in and make the movie and put their stamp on it. You're going to have to find somebody who's lucky to be there um, and who has the competency to do it, but also is knows that like they're replaceable and they're going to do exactly what Disney tells them to do uh, when they tell them to do it. Or someone who wants a piece of film history. If you feel like it's a part of a huge franchise, that's going to be, watched and expanded upon well who did they end up getting though was it jj abrams mm-hmm. yeah i mean like was he a big deal yet i don't think so yeah he had done lost okay he did some tv people knew who jj abrams was i think he'd already done star trek no i don't think he'd done star trek yet they weren't going to give it to anybody who you didn't know like that you know what i'm saying like but they were also yeah. not going to give it to somebody y- y- james cameron wasn't going to get it Like they would, you know, he's just, you're not going to get Spielberg to do it. Somebody who's really can push a studio around, you know, you're not going to get a juggernaut, but George Lucas would have gotten the job. Who in that age group can push a studio around? Well, Cameron, for example, because he'll just spend his own money on the budget. Sure. You've got that age group. Yeah. But who in the JJ Abrams age group can push a studio around? Why is the age, I don't well, why, why are we limiting our selection process for a Star Wars film to a specific age group? Or are you just about like we're not I'm just saying like the, the directors you're talking about, like Lucas, Spielberg, yeah. Cameron can push around studios because they became huge in a time where like directors were less pawns of the studio. To some extent, yeah. I mean, like Lucas went on and made his own company. Well, all like, those guys started out independently too, which is another point yeah. too. Like Lucas made his own movies with his own money, well, some studio money, but you know what I'm saying. The the um, also in an age where people went to go see movies specifically for directors, like maybe Nolan, maybe Nolan Tarantino. is the guy who can push a studio around. He actually is that guy. And probably Tarantino as well, because I know that from Nolan, because he is like a famous D bag about insisting on shooting on film when the entire industry wants to move on and just dragging the studio, kicking and screaming and being a real douchebag about release dates and like really digging his heels in and getting what he wants. And and just being so, yeah, Nolan, there you go. Yeah. Like people didn't go to Oppenheimer because they've been dying for a movie about Oppenheimer. No, they I went because so. Nolan made another movie. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. And I think Tarantino, but Tarantino is even older than that. Yeah. This than point. Chris Nolan? Maybe not. Maybe they're contemporaries. Uh, kind of. Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like Nolan's a little behind Tarantino in terms of timeline. Tarantino kind of makes a scene in the early 90s. I think, I'm, I don't know when Memento comes out, but I feel like that was mid to later nineties. Yeah. Um, So maybe like an eight year career separation or something like that. All right. So actually to the topic at hand, alien. Well, we're talking about, we're talking about Ridley Scott, which is how we ended up on directors, which is in now. Right. I just feel like Ridley Scott is, so he comes out with a movie every goddamn year for the most part for like ever now. And um, I don't know. I don't think that most of them even get thought of as Ridley Scott movies. I think that like, they're just that movie that showed up, you know? Yeah. I also think we talked about in Blade Runner that um, he makes his portfolio is more broad in terms of the types of movie he take movies he takes on like any genre. They all have different aesthetics. Right. So he's not, he's more interested in like learning a style than he is like, 
Like, I am Tim Burton. I make movies that look and feel like this. I, you know, and I always am surprised that that like lasts as long as it does. Like, I've been waiting for, and I like his movies, but I've been waiting for uh, uh, um, Wes Anderson's like mm-hmm. thing that that when is that star going to fade? Great like, example. how much yeah. of that? I mean, is it already now? Like, how much of that? I think so. Can people handle? <laughs> like, he's not pulling Nolan numbers for sure. Never did. Never yeah. did. No, come on. Although yeah. the idea of a Wes Anderson directed comic book movie sounds cool. I'd be very curious <laughs> to see it happen. <laughs> but yeah, to your point, he just doesn't, he doesn't go outside of his box. He's got and a very specific thing he does. Yeah. Ridley Scott, he's all over the place. He's more of a, I mean, James, Ridley James Cameron Scott does mostly makes movies. Wes Anderson yeah, makes movies. Wes Anderson movies. That's right. I I agree with you. So I think it's no surprise to me that people can't recognize a Ridley Scott movie in the way that they can recognize. They don't often Anderson even market movie. them that way. Yeah. I mean, I think I wanted to go see Kingdom of Heaven. I didn't know until the direct the credits came up that it was a Ridley Scott movie at the time. I just thought like, oh, cool, movie about the Crusades, neat. Well, we were both surprised to find out he did the uh, movie with Lady, the TV movie with Lady Gaga. Was it Chanel? Was it? Oh, House Ju- of Gucci. House of Gucci. Yeah, I had no clue. Yeah. None. Um, yeah, the dude's busy, man. He keeps working. I don't know. Yeah. All right. He loves what he does. So, all right. Should we talk through Alien the movie? Oh, we don't we haven't done the tagline. I think this I think this is the most memorable, famous tagline of film history. It could be. In space, no one can hear you scream. Brilliant. I have a hard time thinking I, if someone asked me a tagline for this movie, even before I had seen it, I would have been able to tell it to you, yeah. but I don't think I could tell you any other tagline for any movie <laughs> off the top of my off head. Off the top of my head. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and what a fucking tagline that is. Mm-hmm. My God, that chilling. You hear it now. Um, and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like the first time that that concept came across your bow, oh, mm-hmm. oh, ice cold, man. I don't know. Yeah. You are in a floating vessel. And if anything happens to that vessel, you are done. It yeah. is over. Yeah. Uh, so building the tension of that, you start right with the tagline, right with the marketing of the movie. Um, speaking of the marketing of the movie, the trailer, are you familiar mm-hmm. with the trailer? With the, no, I'm not. Mm-mm. Oh, there's a classic trailer. It's just one shot and oh, um, yeah. it's sweeping in low over this like rocky, uh, cracked terrain and it pulls in, um, over the top and finally it, it lands on an egg. Um, mm. and it, uh, that's when, uh, and the whole time I think the letters are appearing over the top, like hieroglyphs. Actually, I think that that's exactly what how Ridley Scott described him as like hieroglyphs. Um, that shot is a tray of brownies with an actual chicken egg sitting on it. And I can <laughs> it's absolutely like watch Phenomenal. It. it is. I mean, I love it. It's amazing what you can do with some, uh, you know, close up tabletop cinematography and good lighting. Lighting. I'm blown yeah. away. Um, <laughs> We'll put some clips up of that definitely Brownies for YouTube egg, watchers. Man. It's unbelievable. <laughs> that's that's an incredible story. I know. I'm full of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get into it. I think um, I heard this noted, and I think this is great to note that there is no li- no dialogue for the first six minutes of this film. Actually, you're not even seeing humans. You're just on Machines. this slow, methodical yeah. tour of... The ship, the thing we need to preserve to stay alive in this movie. So 10 years before they were producing this, in other words, Space Odyssey comes out. And it was like in 68 when Space Odyssey came out, science fiction was a B genre. There were very few serious mm-hmm. science fiction movies. None of them really attempted to even look real. Like there was the idea of like a big budget for special effects was crazy. You know, you're talking about the day the earth stood still, you know, that would be like mm-hmm. a really top tier science fiction movie from that time period from before six before um that movie came out so i think and then there's not a lot if i'm not mistaken in that space movie science fiction space between 2001 and alien there's silent running comes to mind well Uh, when star wars comes out 
77. Oh, Alien 79. Yeah, 77. So. so it's right there. But Star Wars is also, um, and you're not wrong, actually. That's also a thing people talk about, too. Is it between Star Wars and Alien, or uh, between Star Wars and um, 2001? There's like very little actual cinematic gap, even though there's a number of years and like what a different aesthetic they go in. But like, I think that Alien. It's on there, you know, I mean, like it's, it's on that mind with that. And like the, the focus of, uh, how in mm-hmm. 2001, and you're getting echoes of that as an influence with the ship waking up and all these machines and stuff. Like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of that is in there too. You even have like sort of the AI, the bad guy computer is in this movie. Mm-hmm. Mother. I was thinking about a list of those. Yeah. I love calling it mother. Mother. But yeah, I think that the aesthetics of 2001 were on their mind and a thing mm-hmm. to kind of respond to in alien and as well as star Wars. Yeah. Maybe I'm talking out of turn. I thought that I had read that somewhere about um, 2001 having like a looming large kind of over the shoulder of this movie and being something that was on his mind, but I don't, I don't think I'm, you're wrong. I think that star Trek and star Wars are different class, maybe of space movie. Sure. Well, Star Wars is almost a callback to something like Flash Gordon in a lot of ways. Right. Like, I I think it. They always say that. I don't think that actually. I mean, like he always says, "Oh, it was like these serials," but like Star Wars is about a lot of stuff. That, right. Like, like the action is the point, not the science fiction. You're not worried about how the Millennium Millennium Falcon operates, drives. Like the singular focus of this movie is the ship and yes. the people on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a lifeboat really. And how the ship functions and. Yeah. So six minutes of just spaceship tour. Silent exploration. Uh, Kind of establishing our sets. The sets that they built were like legit. They weren't like three walled. They were full on like stuff was removable to put cameras in places, but every they were fully three dimensionally realized. So like the wall that you can't see because the camera it's like there's like a hole that they're looking through and stuff like that. They specifically wanted it to be one-to-one complete build so that it felt really claustrophobic for the actors. Um, Well, and is this the movie I read that every day he like pushed the walls like an inch or two closer? I don't know, but if he did, that's such like, so they never realized that they were losing space and it was getting tighter and tenser. Maybe. I mean, I love that idea, but on the other hand, I also think like, but the minute he wasn't looking, some grip moved it back because like, <laughs> like how the fuck am I going to fit We're the camera here in your boss? You know, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine that that actually, you know, there's a lot of people who say that like, oh, this in hindsight, it's very easy to say this weird thing that we did is a big part of why this thing succeeded. But like, it, maybe, <laughs> Maybe that just got in everybody's way. We'll see if we run into it when we're looking through trivia or anything, but I had heard that somewhere. There was, um, I don't know what made me think about that. I'll tell you what made me, this is the the thought process I just went through. Uh, some actor told me, oh, Elia Kazan used to do that because I was giving separate notes to different actors about scene direction. And I thought, oh, mm. okay. And uh, I was like, I didn't know that. And then I saw uh, Celluloid Closet about the secret, like, you know, coded gay characters in the history of cinema. And it was, <laughs> it was about Spartacus and how uh, both of, there's a famous bath scene in it where, I, I, you know, I can't remember the last time I saw Spartacus, but it's uh, Kirk Douglas and who's the guy from, uh, oh God, he was in Some Like It Hot. Tony, I want to say Tony Bennett, but it's not Tony Bennett. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's a singer. Not an actor. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like they had been given different direction. So it's mm-hmm. a scene that had long been suspected of being, um, you know, coded gay, but apparently like Tony Curtis, Tony Curtis. Yeah. I think it's Tony Curtis and Kirk Douglas he gave the separate directions on it so that like everybody on set thought like we're filming this scene, like basically one actor in the scene. And I forget who it was, was told on the side. And it was great to see these interviews and like this footage, like you are gay. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this is a, a, a reunion between you and your former lover. And when you watch the scene, it's, it's kind of hilarious <laughs> mm-hmm. because like the one guy is just like the other guy keeps just trying to get closer. 
<laughs> try it. And the the one of them seems really the one seems really blissfully unaware about what's going on. Maybe even uncomfortable. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, I don't know why I got onto that. Uh, secrets secrets directors think make their movies better, but maybe yeah, they don't. right, sure, maybe but they maybe don't. they don't. All right, so the crew of the ship Nostromo wakes up from hypersleep, and right. do they discover they're not home yet? Like mother tells them almost like, immediately um, mm-hmm. that they're nowhere they're supposed to be, and that they were woken up for a um, distress signal. Mother right. does not speak out loud in this movie either. Mother is only text on a screen, if I'm not right. mistaken. Yeah, has no voice, which I actually I love that choice. Sure. Yeah. I wonder if they wrestled with that back and forth. That's one of those cases where like whoever made that choice, was, it was a good call because it's so dehumanizing. She doesn't speak at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's an alien. It's like from some other dimension, just reaching through with its barest little finger, you know? Well, and it's, it's the company's orders. Like, yeah, she's not making their best like interests in, or she's not making decisions in their best interest. No. The company is sending the ship orders. Yeah. That she is relaying. Or they were programmed a long time ago. I mean, sure. I, they're way outside of communications range. If she catches a, su- a certain type of signal, she d- this is her protocol. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they're obligated to investigate stress call coming from a planetoid, right? Yep. And th- the idea is that it would be another ship in their like, fleet or they what don't is... Know. They don't they know. They just know it's a distress call. Yeah. Um, and I think that... I wonder why they would need to respond to that. Uh, That's like maritime law. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like, I think that that's literally hearkening to the fact that like, if you're on a boat and you hear a distress call and you're not like in uh, trouble your own self, you are obligated by law to respond. Got it. And I assume that they would just extend that into space. Yeah, I would hope so. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Um, And then three crew members leave the ship. They discover, so they discover another ship. Uh, yep. That's, they land, they find a derelict spacecraft that they determine is not of human origins. Okay. Not of human origins. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So it is an alien ship. Yes, definitely. They recognize it as such immediately designed by HR Geiger and just filled with human orifices, just made of body parts, naughty little body parts all over the place, <laughs> just buttholes, penises, and vaginas. Yeah. That's what it's someone was calling the ship. Like it looked like two spread legs. And it is. If you look at his artwork, we'll put an it's image like up. stuff that he had been designing and using in artwork way before this movie ever was made even. So there you go. I guess mm-hmm. that builds tension. Yeah, sure. Um, and they're discovering, right, also, uh, were they discovering evidence that another crew had tried to help? No, I don't recall in that this? in the film. Okay, all right. I, I don't think that has ever brought up, actually. But they stumble across the field of eggs. The eggs. That was that were all built all 130 of them were built individually for this shot there was only 130 because i think they use mirrors to extend it dramatically because it oh, looks really? like it's more than that there are thousands i mean she even says there were thousands and thousands of eggs in the sequel mm-hmm. um yeah i think that there's a tremendous number so they built 130 and then yeah the the nice slow shot where they look over into the egg and like everything about you the viewer is telling you like we don't need to look further like that's (laughs) we've seen it let's go yeah dude in prometheus there's like a beat where they go to some the planet some other place they're getting there they're looking at the whole alien stuff and it's like a prequel to alien um not a sequel and one of them is like some like they bring a bunch of scientists and one of them mm-hmm. is like an astrobiologist who studies life from other planets and like there's a scene where a fucking space snake is coming up on this supposed scientist and his response is to an effect hey cutie what are you about oh you're crawling up my arm Oh, it's so adorable. And then of course, you know, it strangles him and murders him to death very no. quickly. And like I can't that was probably the moment when I checked out on that one because I was just like <laughs> nah. I get that people are dumb, but come on. Like yeah. I'm not even an astrobiologist and I know to get the fuck away from a space snake. Come on. <laughs> Well, and likewise, so maybe the reason I thought that they came across something human was that the distress call turns out to be a warning. Yes. 
and they're sort of figuring this out as you're seeing uh, the face hugger attach itself they to never, our They decide our that, actually, because they never actually okay. decode it. It's not in English, but then they, they decide at some point, oh, maybe this is a warning. Okay. Um, All right. And then the, the of course when we get to the spaceship we see the the creature called the um the astronomer which is like this elephant bones man strapped into some giant telescope thing. Mm-hmm. Um, in Prometheus or the sequel we see what that actually is. It's like a pilot dude. So it sounds like the like further out sequels and I, these I haven't seen really do expand upon our understanding of what we're seeing in the first movie. Right, is that so right? So here's the thing there. Are, <laughs> and, and this is an interesting point, right? There are two timelines. I don't know. Ridley Scott made alien and I guess he didn't talk about it much and he didn't have any interest in having input on the sequel or whatever, which is great because you get aliens, which is a phenomenal film. And yes, he was a, labeled a producer on the sequel, but that can mean a million different things. He got paid. Right. Um, but whatever the case, like, Ridley Scott had very clear ideas um, about these things not being a fusion of living stuff and technology. They are biomechanical, which is which is why they look the way that they do. They are living mechanical, so they're not like made out of like cyber metal parts, but like they have like hoses on them and stuff. And mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, if you mm-hmm. look at the original Geiger body, there's a human skull behind this like weird translucent dome that Mm. is part of the head and stuff like that. Um, And that's why Geiger's art was used as the, the inspiration here. And he said something to the effect that they're like some kind of a weapon that is made in a a weapons lab. Uh, It's biomechanical, blah, blah, blah. Mm. James Cameron, I guess didn't know this or didn't care because I'm assuming that they just didn't have a discussion about it, came in and decided they are insects. So they have a big queen. That lays eggs. Yeah, which is interesting because I, I had a problem with that, with them just calling them animals and stuff. Because in the first movie, it's like, well, they had a spaceship, yeah. maybe, yeah. if it was theirs. And they so they're intelligent enough for that. Well, I think that there's a consideration. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the egg chamber is really like a bomb bay. And mm-hmm. I think that was what Ridley had said. And like the pilot is like not one of those things that astronomer, mm. astronomer guy. And like the idea was to like, they drop just get these. dropped on a yeah. planet. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Fucking eviscerated. Um, okay. I think that was kind of the idea, but I also think that like, it was one of those things where like, you maybe not have had most specific ideas and, and that like only needing to know what's on camera is fine. Um, yeah. But so like, there's a whole alien universe where there are bugs that begins with aliens and then continues forward in time from that point. Prometheus is a prequel. It's Ridley Scott finally went back to the series to do a prequel. And then he did a follow-up to Prometheus, which is a sequel to Prometheus, another prequel, but I forget the name of that. Both movies were panned to some extent. Mm -hmm. And I think Mm -hmm. now I've heard that like some people think that Prometheus was ahead of its time. It's better than people said it was probably true. Mm -hmm. Um, But those are firmly in the Scott universe. Those are firmly in the Ridley Scott universe where they are not insects. They are intelligent inscrutable weird science shit man they are okay. fucking bizarro stuff um and so there is that going on here there's like two alien universes and maybe even more because like there's a whole comic series about alien versus predator where they like are a shared universe for ridley scott I, if I'm not mistaken, Alien is a shared universe with Blade Runner. Like some of the companies from Blade Runner are, if I'm not, I think that's true, are also present in. Is that right? Or am I thinking of Wayland Yutani? Whatever. Um, I feel like there's some crossover there as well. But mm. yeah, yeah, it, it gets confusing. All right. Where well, were we at? Where were we? <laughs> well, so the crew member gets face hugged. Face hugged. He gets attacked by a face hugger that attaches I'll himself hug face. Yeah. and impregnates him, so, sort of. Yes. It which shoved, you don't know yet. But. Shoves an egg down his throat. Yeah, we don't know right. that yet. And then it just it, like lets go and goes away after seeming to strangle him and keep him alive of its own volition. And like everybody just like brings this no, guy they cut to him, dinner. They cut him. Yeah. And it that's when the acid blood and comes it runs out. through the house. Through which the like this is a huge moment for me in the Dan O'Bannon space because- like one thing we talked about with return of the living dead is how 
hopeless it seems to fight these zombies yes. because there's no way to kill them. Yes. And it seems like you've got these aliens. Why not just kill them? They needed an answer to that question. Actually, I read further that like that is something they were questioning. Like, what's going to stop them from just cutting them apart, killing them? Yep. Fine. And because if you do that, you could bleed a hole through your ship and kill your entire crew entire right. that way. It feels hopeless. You yeah. can't cut them open. You can't shoot them. Yeah. Like, if that's his brain that does that, he makes the most terrifying creatures yeah. in film history. Well, they're not so scary on a planet, though. They're only scary out in a spaceship. But we're in a spaceship. So but we're in a spaceship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. I was going to say the eggs. Dan O'Bannon's always got Easter eggs. Mm. He's got a, a spaceship full of eggs. <laughs> yeah. He's got dark stars, got the Easter eggs, the nuclear bombs. He's got the mm-hmm. Easter eggs in the return of the living dead filled with zombies. There's always an egg. And when it hatches, yeah, bad it thing hatches. happens. Yeah. <laughs> like, the man That's hates true. eggs. He's terrified <laughs> of eggs. <laughs> got an egg fear. But then, yes, you're right. Like they get, so it comes off his face. It dies. Everyone's like, "Great, <laughs> problem resolved." And then, uh, and then we go to lunch or dinner or whatever meal they're eating, uh, where you get the famous scene where the alien comes out of his chest. Yeah, which supposedly the cast didn't know that was going to happen, or to limiting degrees. They didn't know how bloody it yeah. was going to be. Or uh, yeah, you always hear that. It's like, well. <laughs> Come on, dude. Like, you know, yeah. they're seeing things that aren't in the frame, guys. There's like, oh, there's well, yeah. four crew people doing under the table down there. And <laughs> yeah. I wonder what's going to happen, boss. That's right. I'm Ridley Scott. And you don't know what's going to happen. And I'm going to say that for years to come. <laughs> Okie dokie, boss. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I agree with that. The idea of acting that like, no, no, that's a real reaction. Like, yeah, yeah. that's what acting is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should be. Yeah. Sometimes you catch moments that are outtakes or whatever that end up being wonderful but sure. yeah I, I, I agree it feels a little outlandish that they would be able to orchestrate that plus it's like once the first shot goes off Gotta do another cats take. out of the bag yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and so unless everything again. was a first take uh they got an idea of what was going on in the scene at some point the the reaction that uh, veronica cartwrights was the one that uh, people often cite as being like right. the most Oh God, I didn't know that was going to happen reaction. And if you watch, she does stumble backwards and like fall through a window. Yeah. (laughs) Like she goes end over end. uh, And it is, I mean, I hope that was real because power to hear, like, I hope it wasn't, I hope she was acting. Right. I I hope that was prowess as an actor and not simply being tricked into performing. Yeah, uh, I like to believe that, but like, God yeah. damn, man, she takes it all the way to 11 in that response. Yeah. How frustrating is an actor that your good performances are always stolen from you by people being like, aha, we have tricked them into being good at their jobs. I have heard people say that it's very frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That becomes the lore about that moment. There's also too, like a lot of people say like, um, oh God, what's his name? Um <sighs> the abyss uh the lead actor in that won't talk people always say for years now he won't discuss working on the abyss blah 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 mm. yeah he was probably contractually obligated to promote the abyss uh or at the very least not say anything negative about it blah 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 and so like i got nothing to that's say. it i got yeah. nothing to say it's not like i've it's taken probably safer a vow to of say silence. nothing absolutely yeah. safer to say nothing yeah you know powerful people in this business you know i just got nothing to say it's not like he took yep. a vow of silence he's stricken it from his memory it's a career decision guys it's just yeah. it's just work I'm just working here <laughs> that makes sense well and this is the point in which like ripley goes from just being a part of the crew to kind of standing out as the heroine of the final movie. girl yeah, and she, like, she is the only voice of caution. So oh, that yeah, from stands the beginning. Out. And they do it so well because you know she's right. Oh, yeah. You're kind of, like, hoping no one will point that out, right? But people would be furious if in this movie where they have clear protocols against things like this, no one said, hey, guys, 
you don't just like bring this onto our ship. That's right. not a thing that we would do here. So you need her to say it and it to be ignored. And then for the longest time, I was like, why would watching this movie? I think I was like, why would, um, what's the name of the cybernetic character in this movie? You know, Ash. Ash. Discount her so quickly. That seems weird. Everyone knows their safety's on the line here. You think people would be a little more scared floating in space yeah. with a foreign creature on board, but he has ulterior motives. Also, probably doesn't need things like air. Well, it's not a big deal for him. Yeah, right. right. But the rest of the crew, you'd be expecting to be a little more freaked out by the presence of this thing on board. Tries to make her eat a magazine. The way he tries to kill her is so fucked up. So weird. Like, dude, I, I Sh- rolls up a magazine, shoving it down her throat. I I wonder if that was an actor moment or if like Ridley or somebody, you know what I mean? Like, was that scripted or was that I just don't like know. F- f- one magazines? Why? I mean, they've been on the ship for hundreds of years. They must be so boring <laughs> now. There's like, they're not getting new ones, but fine. They're there. Uh, maybe he was just tired of solving that same word puzzle over and over. But like, yeah. I wonder if that was like an inspired moment because like the frustration that boils over yeah. in his face when he finally pulls up that magazine and, and rolls it up. I, whoever came up with that, if it was just him taking that moment in the scene i don't know but like it it's terrifying it's like what are you doing it's well, so and I guess, like, weird it's like you your brain can't is fire, broken can't fire guns you're in a ship like yeah you've gotta strangle her somehow but to not yeah to, yeah it's it's really off offsetting to shove something in her mouth because like, it's so oh. weird it's so it's so like what you know people strangle people like this you know there's like so yeah, many right. other ways to do that and it's just like and there's no music and it's long cuts and just like yeah. sloppy slipping on the floor just like in oh it's visceral in that moment yeah well and he's like sweating milk at this point yes. like bleeding milk which that's a great shot too so we went forward a little bit but basically they're chasing down this thing and it's picking up it picks off a couple of crew members then you see ash she's skeptical of ash and she confronts him about something oh no she's discovered that mother and ash are in cahoots she goes and talks to the computer herself she goes and talks to him and as there's just a close-up shot of him and i think it cuts off about like here and you just see this white drip down his head and you have no idea why like until it, a moment later when you learn, but it's such a great moment. So it sounds like you had previously said this movie didn't land for you and that it was a slow burn and kind of boring. I don't know. Have you changed your tune? Because I'm hearing a lot of praise. So this, we watched the director's cut this time. Okay. Notes on that, but coming up. Yeah. I was looking at major differences between the director's cut and uh, the theatrical release. And one major difference is he took about 10 or 15 seconds off of just tons of scenes. Oh, that's interesting. Just sped it up. I think that that really changed the movie for me in a fundamental way. So I, uh, did you watch him introduce the director's cut? Well, doesn't he hate the director? He's like, it, this is just a marketing it's tool. It's a producer's a, cut, he calls yeah. it. Yeah. There is no director's yeah. cut. I got the cut I wanted in the theatrical cut, but they asked me to make one for the DVD. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So he just trimmed scenes everywhere. And I think he yeah. added... There's one one thing that he added. I have it in here somewhere. I saw that intro and I was like, well, I'm going to skip this. He added a scene where the crew listened to the alien signal and discussed the nature of the planet just before they prepare to land. Okay. And yeah, he has remarked that he's unhappy about the director's cut because the original was pretty flawless. The director's cut is merely a marketing tool, he said. You know, you got to love a guy who just does not mince words or give a fuck. I mean, (laughs) the studio asks you to make a director's cut and your immediate response is, this is bullshit. Yeah. Publicly. Why? Not like, I'm not going to do that. Like, (laughs) give me your money. And then I'm going to promote it by telling people what a piece of garbage it is. Like, (laughs) balls, man. That guy's got balls. That's for sure. (laughs) Um, All right. So just to wrap this up here. So I'm a, I'm a little bit, can you fill in the holes of what happens between them killing Ash and her ending up on the, getting herself on the shuttle as the only living member of the crew at this point? I, you know, honestly, it becomes so fast. I don't really recall. Yeah. 
I know that she has to, she sets off a self-destruct sequence. She saves the cat. Um, it's very tense. There's a lot of running. They rig up the, the motion. Three of them are trying to make it, but only she does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's right. And then it's still on the shuttle and she blasts it out into space. And what's crazy is it's still moving. It tries to climb back in after it's out in space. Um, you know, it is unstoppable. It, I want to talk about some of the other weird themes in this movie. All right. Um, yeah. He, well, then she she puts herself into hypersleep, and that's where we leave yep, Ripley. Her and the cat. Floating in space. Yeah. With Jones in yeah, hypersleep. To be met up with in aliens with a dollar sign. Which uh, we will cover as we've gone an hour already. We will cover in a separate episode. So I just want to talk. There's more to say. Yeah. Some, some stuff I've, I learned. One thing I learned from the director's commentary that I watched was that in that boot up sequence, you see all these uh, biometric readouts of all the characters. Mm-hmm. And I forget the wording it used, but it indicated if they were currently living under their birth sex or a modified sex. And Mm -hmm. Ridley Scott explains that in the movie, which by the way, 1979. um, Yeah. I just figured these people are functionally immortal. They live out in space. They sleep for, you know, century at a time, uh, cruising from the blah, blah, blah. And I think that people will probably get bored after being, you know, this for a couple hundred years. And maybe they just play around and swap back and forth and try out weird stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe not the I love most that. enlightened take on things. And, but like, also, all right, <laughs> you're ahead of the curve, sort of there, man. He understood that gender was a construct and over a hundred years it might change. Yeah, I mean, he's talking about, you know, are we talking <laughs> about gender or are we talking about sex? Because they're different things. Gender, I said gender yeah, is right. construct. But he, but he's talking about sex. He's talking about your your bits. No, not no? necessarily. You don't think so? Okay. I don't. No. I, maybe I'm not clear on how this works. Yeah. I'm dumb. You can change your outside appearance. That would be changing. I mean, you change your gender. You can't change your sex. Is basically the hard and fast rule. He's saying that's not true. Well, not in the future, I mean, not an alien. And he, yes, sure, sure, sure. Maybe they have ways of of completing that change. Yeah, seamlessly, because one of the characters is at least one of the characters is supposed to be, um, I guess trans would be that. I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Do you use the right term? Do you use the nineteen seventy nine terminology or whatever he had in mind? Or no, nah, nah, you use current ter- terminology. Yeah. Um, which one was it? It was uh, Veronica Cartwright, right? Her character. Uh, which is Lambert. Lambert. Yes, that's what you had said, Lambert. Yeah. The other thing, and I read a book uh, you know, about Alien. It was a short book. I don't know. I don't know where I got this book from. I got it off a desk at the School of Visual Arts. I would just steal books from teachers all the time. Um, and I don't remember who wrote it, but I thought it was interesting. Broke down. I don't know if I 100% agree with this. I don't think it would have been intentional either, by the way. I think this is one of those things where, oh, yeah, maybe that's true. That's one of the reasons it's scary subconsciously. But that the reason the alien is scary is because throughout a lot of human history, becoming pregnant when you didn't want to be was like the Mm. worst fucking thing that could happen to you. And this creature uh, regards all life as female and equally impregnable and it'll Mm. fucking rape you with its inner mouth (laughs) um i appreciate that take yeah especially because so yeah i mean if you take it there too this this movie is playing with gender roles in a lot of different ways sure yeah just by the virtue of having ridley kind of ridley ripley be the uh the super badass right right well and by no means I guess this is more true in aliens than alien. Does she seem to be your most likely to survive character when you meet them at the beginning? You've right. got a lot more macho, you know, masculine guys on the ship. Yeah, 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 yeah. In aliens, yeah. Well, and also I guess an alien you kind of have them as well. But she Dallas is a cowboy. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. But she uh she just does what needs to be done. She adapts yep. quickly. She doesn't want to die. Yeah. And th- yeah. that's, I mentioned final girl before, and I think that this book also introduced me to that term. That's a thing from slasher flicks. So mm. you frequently, I mean like the final girl is a well-worn trope. Jamie Lee Curtis. Always the final girl. Yeah. Every slasher flick comes down to the final girl. Sydney and Prescott. Yeah. The, the bad dude. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
the, the book that, you know, I think that the point about the alien regarding all of us as impregnable, impregnable, whatever is the, is cool. They went on to like yeah. talk about every angle reinforces this from like the, the, the upskirt shots of Ripley when she's like in her tiny underwear and stuff. I don't mm-hmm. know if I buy that. Like that. I, mm-hmm. I think that they were just trying to sell the movie. Get with her those. back in her, get her down to her tidy whities again. Yeah. There's no reason for it. She just gets comfortable on the ship and she's alone. So she strips down and we find out she's not alone. Was that it? Was, I yeah. Thought, okay. Yeah. 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 I thought she so was, was getting waiting. ready to go to sleep. She's getting ready to go to hypersleep. She is. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. So, but she sits. She undresses and then sits in the chairs, finishing up some stuff. She's not getting into the hypersleep chamber Mary, when she discovers. There's a reason for it, and it's, oh. <laughs> it's ticket sales. We all know. I mean, sure. like, there's a reason those underwears are like eight sizes too small for. Yeah, they're tiny. <laughs> they're tiny underwears. I was like absurd. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they knew what they were selling here. Okay, they're making, yeah. they're, we're going to try to make some money off this thing. Okay, guys, we got to make some money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and mean, that's what I had about this movie. I love it. It's so good. It's yeah. It's like, I don't know, it might be the best horror sci-fi, the best mashup of those genres. And of right. course, I mean, I don't know, maybe I, me and Bannon are just, Dan O'Bannon are just on like, Dan O'Bannon. Man, there he is mm-hmm. again. He loves them titties. He loves uh, tiny, t- <laughs> tiny little panties. <laughs> little tiny weddies. I don't know if that was his choice, but sure. It was in the script. Then they're too small. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I, uh, I just we're on the same wavelength. I don't know. His stuff really works for me. Yeah. What do you think? You liked it better when it was fifteen seconds shorter. <laughs> when each scene were 15. I don't know if that's what moved it along. I don't know if it's like. Maybe you're just in the right headspace or something too. Well, it's also like, this happens to me with music a lot. I like music. I like songs the second, third, fourth time I listen to them more. The first time I listen to a song, I'm 90% of the time, I'm like, that's eh, fine. I see. And then it might have been because I know know what's coming, I was paying more attention to the filmmaking, to the build of tension, to um, to the character building, to the nuances, to Ripley, like, uh, and I walked away with. I was also maybe paying attention to the movie differently. I don't remember. Like we were sure. You were watching it for reviewing purposes, right? Yeah. Like, I think the first time I watched it, we kind of had it on in the background and kept checking in and being like, they're still on this planet. Like, I, we weren't feeling the tension that was being built. We were breaking it by doing other things. You got to put the phones away. You know, a- it wasn't a phone thing. We It was during COVID. We had moved into our house. We were probably working on rebuilding our living room, honestly. Probably. So, um. So yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely um, environment matters when you're watching movies, especially like this, that are meant to have your full attention, meant to be seen in a theater. For sure. Truly. So. For sure. I would love to see this in a theater. I may have done so. I'm trying to remember now. I saw Blade Runner in the theater. That was cool. We're born in 79. No, no. Re-release. The late, uh, like a re-release. Okay. Yeah, yeah. When the direct, when the final cut of Blade Runner came out, it was in theaters briefly. Um, I know we went and saw The Shining in the theater one Halloween. Like you know, movies they show movies in theaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in the city. Yeah. Yeah, man. There's so few movies I will rewatch. No TV shows. I've I've never been one of those people who just wants to rewatch a show. I can't do it. I tried. I tried to watch Foils more than or more than once, and it didn't work for me. Um, But like, this is one of the movies I will rewatch. Alien. Yeah. Well, now I am. My interest is peaked to sort of go down. I know three is bad. People like it's four. David Fincher's first movie. Yeah. Um, and People going like, down the Prometheus line. I'm curious about where they take it. Four is, I recall four being fun. You know what I mean? Well, Joss did it. So it's. I know it's got a different tone. Oh, that's Joss Whedon? I'm pretty sure. That makes a lot of sense because I recently heard it described as the prototype for Firefly. Sure. Yeah. Like the the people who show up are the 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 characters Space who Cowboys. would become literally the characters in Firefly, like the same okay. character types. Um. So I think I'll chase. That yeah, makes a lot my, of sense. Though. Once we hit September and we start pulling out all the spooky movies, I'll chase this line. Yeah, we're gonna have to do Night of the Further. Comet too, or Day of the Comet. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're, okay. You're gonna love that. One. You, you have seen it. We watched it at my house. <laughs> oh yeah, I love that movie. Yeah. That is, that's a deep cut. We should do like a month of really deep like movies that most people probably haven't seen. Oh yeah, like we could call it Midnight Local Deep Cuts. Deep cuts. Deep cuts. That's a word we've invented. You know, like priming the pump. I made up that phrase. We invented deep cuts. Okay, that was a Trump joke. <laughs> oh, he I claimed was... to have invented the phrase priming, priming the, the pump. Yeah. Which, oh, goodness. You know that phrase? I made that up. That like... <laughs> <laughs> He's like, that, I, I, heard it, the, I heard it once, so I assume nobody else has ever heard it, so I could just claim it as my own. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening to Midnight Local. I think we're wrapped, right? Yeah, we're wrapped. I, yeah, I was going to say, if we want to push it a little longer, but. I got to pee. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. Thank you to Annie Villalobos for producing the show. Thank you to Heather Vaughn for making beautiful artwork for our show. Yes, and to uh, Studio 71 for being our partners in this. Um, Thank you for automatically billing my account every 30 days. Epidemic Sound. You haven't missed a beat yet. Thank you. (laughs) Most reliable service. (laughs) All right, see you later, gang. Bye-bye. Next time on Midnight Local.